you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I have to say, and I know you must agree with me, what a beautiful, beautiful night. We look fantastic out here tonight, and uh, this is just a perfect night. I want to begin by saying thank you so much to the most experienced, visionary, and dynamic sheriff in the state of Maryland. Do you agree with me? Can we have a round of applause for Sheriff Melvin High? And I say that without exaggeration, we are so very, very fortunate to have a sheriff with his experience, but not only that, but to have a sheriff with his compassion, with his level of caring, and it really has made a tremendous difference in our community. This event, I tell you, just gets better and better and better every year. And so I want to say thank you to the sheriff, thank you to the office of the sheriff and all of our deputies who make this possible and all the staff is just fantastic. And we are just so grateful. I also want to say to our sheriff, thank you as well for doing something that is so important. When we talk about domestic violence, I want us to understand so clearly what it is we're fighting about. We're fighting about our families. And it is this sheriff who has decided that chief on his list and one of the priorities of his administration has been to fight for our families because we understand that the violence we discuss is violence that has ravaged and torn apart and dismantled single-handedly the families of Prince George's County. So thank you, Mr. Sheriff, for putting our families at the top of your list. I'm sad to say that domestic violence is not new. As you heard the sheriff mention, I began my career in 1997 as the first full-time domestic violence prosecutor to work in the state's attorney's office. And it was during that time that I had an experience that I will never forget. It was one afternoon when I was working in the office, I was there on office duty, when we had a call, a walk-in, to actually come into the state's attorney's office. And I was called to the front of the office to assist a family. And as I came to the front of that office, there was a woman, a man, and a beautiful little girl. The little girl, I believe, had to be about six years old, and she was standing there with her parents. Her mother had filed charges against her father and was there with her husband and said that, you know what, uh, I came here, I, I want to withdraw these charges uh, because there's been an awful mistake. I made a mistake and I need to withdraw these charges. And somehow this brilliant little girl said to me in the middle of it, excuse me, do you have any water back there in your office? And I said, water, okay. So I, I took the little girl with me uh, into the office to go get her some water and she said, she's not telling the truth. He's hurting her, he's hurting her. And so in her brilliance, she knew to disclose that not only was her mother in trouble, but she was in trouble as well. And then as a prosecutor, there was a bad chick who argued tirelessly for victims of domestic violence. She was one of our baddest prosecutors. She was who came to my office one day, closed the door and cried and said that she had been abused as a child and then again raped in college. She had been raped already twice in her life and had been abused. There was my grandmother who passed away at 86 years old and in her last days began the process that many of us are familiar with. It's called sundowning while she was hospitalized. The staff told me that as my grandmother was hospitalized as a result of her Alzheimer's, there's a phenomenon called sundowning. And what she told me was in the night, one of the male nurses tried to come up to, to assist my grandmother. And in her sundowning state, she became terrorized and began to say, oh, please, no, please, no, is what she said. The nursing staff told us, my God, something happened to her. And the reality is that something has happened to too many of us. And as we began the observance of Domestic Violence Awareness, Awareness Month, I'm reminded of the many women and men who suffer in silence every day, who live in fear, and the children who grow up watching and learning from this violence at home. And because we cannot afford to damage not another child, because we cannot afford to lose any more lives, because we cannot afford to push one more victim into the cycle of depression or substance abuse, we must stop the silence that accompanies domestic violence. 
We're discussing this issue in Prince George's County, but it's so important for us to remember that it doesn't just live here. In fact, it affects homes not only here, but in Montgomery County, in Anne Arundel County, in Baltimore County, or Cecil County, and across this nation, and, and quite frankly, around the world. It's in poor homes, and rich homes, and African Americans' homes, and white people's homes, and Hispanic homes, and African homes. It's everywhere. The epidemic of domestic violence and sexual violence has many commonalities, but the silence around it is the most obvious. And in the silence is where it begins to multiply. A former US congressman said so appropriately, if the numbers we see in domestic violence were applied to terrorism or gang violence, the entire country would be up in arms and it would be the lead story on the news. But as we know all too often, these events do, in fact, lead the news. A 27-year-old man who allegedly killed a woman in his Riverdale home just this July. Also, we can't forget the case also in July of a 17-year-old boy who allegedly stabbed his father to death in Bowie. And then very recently, and very personally for, for some of us here, one of our friends lost his sister-in-law who was killed as a grandparent when her son-in-law came to the home and shot and killed the two grandparents and then turned the gun and shot into the car that his own son was riding in. This was in nearby Charles County. Shot his son and the most painful part of this story was my friend told me that when they went to get the, the little boy out of the hospital the next day after his parents, grandparents were murdered, the first thing he said was, did you see my father laughing? as he shot at me in that car. He will never forget the devastation that occurred that day. And you know what? Neither will we. These specific instances make the news as individual headlines, but the story we need to be telling as a society is that there are far too many people dying and suffering in our communities. The headlines in 2019 read as follows, 12 total domestic related murders. 21% of all homicides in 2019 in Prince George's County, six intimate partner, four family, and one child abuse. 21% of all of our homicides so far this year have been from domestic violence. As a government and as a community, we don't like negative he headlines, and I want to make it clear that we're making strides as a community towards ending these tragedies and the silence associated with them. Historically, in Prince George's County, we would usually see between 15 and 20 domestic murders per year. But I'm here to tell you some good news, and I want to thank every single member of law enforcement who is present here tonight. We've started to knock those numbers down. And in fact, over the, since, as a result of the collaboration that we have enjoyed, since 2017, we have seen those numbers cut in half consistently each year. And so we are not where we're going to be, but we are steadily working and those numbers are coming down. But in order to bring the numbers to zero, we must address the elephant in the room. We must stop the silence. We have to talk about the fact that every minute, almost 20 people in this country are abused by an intimate partner. We must talk about the fact that one in four women and one in nine men have experienced intimate partner physical violence, sexual violence, and stalking, leading to mental health issues and fearfulness. We must talk about the fact that girls who witness domestic violence are more likely to grow up and become violent themselves, victims, or substance abusers. And boys who grow up under those circumstances are twice as likely to become abusers themselves. So we must continue to encourage our friends and neighbors to speak out against domestic violence and stop the silence. We must speak up and educate our community about the signs and symptoms of domestic abuse. It's time that we should say no. It is not a sign of love that your boyfriend or spouse knows where you are at all times of day. That's not love. It is not a sign of love that you can go to the movies with your friends and then suddenly he or she shows up. That's not love. It is not okay that he makes you do sexual things against your will or make you feel guilty about your children. And it is not okay 
that he prefers to have you all to himself. We must come together as a community because you know what? There's so many steps before the slap. We have to stop the silence, which is why I was so honored to have spent the last several years in public service advocating and seeking resources for domestic violence survivors. I did this alongside Sheriff High. When we together sought justice for victims, when we together sought resources at the state level to help victims escape safely, it's why together we partner with the faith community to make sure that our pastors and ministerial staff recognize when their congregants are suffering and how to help them. It's why we continue to applaud the work of Sheriff High for bringing awareness to this very important issue each year, reminding us that it will take the whole community to address domestic violence. We cannot sit idly by. We must work together to not only bring awareness to the issue of a domestic violence, but to ultimately stop domestic violence from ever occurring in our community and across the region. Finally, I say, that in the words of all of our favorite First Lady, Michelle Obama, she said, history has shown us that courage can be contagious and hope can take on a life of its own. So tonight, I'm asking everyone here, as well as everyone who may hear this through social media or the news, to be courageous. I'm asking you to help us bring awareness to this issue by doing something so simple is taking one of these purple light bulbs with you as you leave this evening. I'm asking you as well to stand up and speak up for victims, letting people in our community know that we will not tolerate domestic violence. And let me just say this, we cannot pass this scourge on to the next generation. We must eliminate it now. It is for those of us who are here today to show through that one act of courage, through domestic violence awareness, that, we can, that our actions can be contagious and spark other acts of courage across our community. As a community, we will shine a purple light on domestic violence and eliminate the darkness and the silence that surrounds this issue. Together, we will stand up for those who are suffering in silence, and together we will work towards a future where no victim will suffer in silence any longer. So again, I say thank you so much to the Office of the Sheriff, to all the partners here who are here tonight, most especially to our community who have stood together, most especially over these last several years, to raise our voices in unity in defense of our families. Thank you so much again, and may God continue to bless each of you, and may God continue to bless Prince George's County.